This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell, Andrew Donaldson. Thanks for joining us. You know, one thing we try really hard on this program to do is we don't just go drive by and stories. Uh, we touch back in on them. Sometimes we take a day or two to get into them before we touch on them at all. We're going to do that today. Remember our crack pipe story we talked about? The free beacon, the Biden administration, social media, and conservative media freakouts. Well, we've got somebody who also wrote about it, did a lot better job writing about it than I did, so reached out. And here he is, uh, our buddy Andrew Eager. He's a writer over at The Dispatch, uh, among other places. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm doing great. How are you? Thrilled to see you. Uh, new father that's still finding his way too. So congratulations, even though it's been a couple months. I love the baby pictures. That's good content on our Twitter feeds. Appreciate. Oh, it, thanks, man. thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, among the most harmless uh, sorts of Twitter content. People don't tend to get as mad at you over the baby pictures, although it's been known to happen. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's uh, she's she's four months old yesterday and uh, uh, learning to sleep, which is cool uh, <laughs> at long last. And uh, and yeah, things are going pretty well. Yeah, that and that's why we do the food on my Twitter feed all the time too. And I've got uh, 14 through 23. If you ever want to change up for a couple of days, I'd be happy to take the baby and trade. No worries, buddy. All right. Yeah, subject yeah. at hands, though. Last week, uh, we had this story. Washington Free Beacon started with it. It kind of exploded from there. Before we get into the details, though, just big picture, uh, the way you titled your article in the dispatch, I think you agree with me. This is kind of a neat little microcosm of not just stories, but how we cover stories and how people react to how we cover stories, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, absolutely, because the, you know, at, at at bottom, what this is, is a controversy over a, over a little known uh, Health and Human Services grant um, that the Free Beacon first stumbled on, $30 million for, for various programs, um, including uh, what uh, what the Free Beacon characterized and with accuracy as these, these safe smoking kits, um, that there were going to be grants to fund these programs that other states, other cities, other you know, community organizations within various states and cities were already running, basically in order to provide, in the interest of public health, less dangerous forms of paraphernalia for, for users of various illegal drugs. Um, the, the, the thinking being that, you know, if we're going to have people in these communities using illegal drugs, then at the very least, we can blunt the public health impact of that by, by making sure that the paraphernalia that they're using is not, is not also, you know, the, the drugs are not, not good for their health, but at least the, the kind of instruments they're using to, to get the fix are not additionally presenting their own health problems. And that's the, that's, you know, the, the, the thinking behind these programs, that's the thinking behind this grant, which was, a, like I say, a portion of a $30 million grant. But very quickly, almost immediately, in fact, the conversation stops being, after the Free Beacon reports this, about the grant itself and becomes this kind of meta meta media story about the coverage, right? Where it's it's very quickly uh, the HH, or, you know, a lot of Republicans rush to pick up the story um, because they, 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 say it reflects b- badly on the Biden administration. It seems to you know, indicate perspective on uh, illegal drugs on the part of the administration that is, that's more tolerant 
toward the use of them um, that that even you know some argue encourages the use of them by you know making a you know licit pipeline to this this paraphernalia and stuff some of the claims get blown out of proportion as they often do when when things go viral and and people are asserting like a more intense version of the thing than than the free beacon ever reported and then there's the backlash to the backlash of HHS kind of rushing to the story and saying, no, 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 the Free Beacon blew this out of proportion. The Free Beacon actually um, mischaracterized what we said in some ways, but what we said to them about this program. And then, you know, that becomes kind of the the conversation everybody's having is kind of who was too mean to whom, rather than kind of the merits of the, well, not, not even just the merits, but the facts of the program itself, and then the merits of, of that program. Uh, it just becomes yet another story about, you know, who has what biases in the media, which is the, which is the conversation everybody always wants to have anyway, because that's the conversation that is fun to have and is easy to weigh in on um, without really getting up to speed on what the precipitating issue was in the first place. Yeah. And the precipitating issue here, I'm curious how this even got out though, because this is a pretty run of the mill 75 page grant. The free beacon to their credit did what I always want you to do. They linked the actual document. So credit to them for that. This is a pretty standard. If you've ever read a grant, this is a 75 page grant. Safe Smoking Kit appears exactly once, and it appears in a list of 12 other items under the heading of such as, as in these municipalities and state level programs can pick from this list one of these things to do. Somebody either did a really huge deep dive here or some source really wanted this to get out. Do you have any idea which one of those it was? Well, I'm actually not not sure. I did talk to the Free Beacon reporter who who broke the original story in, in the course of reporting my piece, which again, you know, like, like I just said, mine was kind of participating more in the in the meta narrative. Uh, he he was the one who'd done the legwork of, of going and finding this stuff and and you know watched the relevant webinar about the people putting the grant together. Uh, he he didn't tell me whether he got a particular tip to look or whether he's just constantly diving in and out of these grants. In my experience, it's usually the it's usually the former. I mean, it's you know some interested party who is unhappy with, you know, with the way a certain program is going, uh, is say, you know, uh, if you're interested in looking under some rocks, here's a rock for you to look under. And then, you know, you get to the 70 page, 75 page document and there it is. And you, you know, do the reporting from there. But yeah, so it, it is, I mean, it is in terms of the whole program, like, 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 like you say, one very small kind of subset of the thing, but that's how, I mean, that's how these things work, right? I mean, these, it's always in the, the case in these, in these stories of, of kind of big federal disbursements that basically it is just kind of a, a laundry list of things that are, that are being formulated. And so the interesting conversation is, it, it doesn't necessarily tell you much that it is just a, a small subset because the interesting conversation we had is, well, there, there is a whole kind of argument that this, that this grant is, dipping into and pulling out of. Um, there's this whole safe smoking harm reduction uh, movement in terms of public policy uh, that that this is sort of the first uh, real federal endorsement of, of of its kind. And so it's and so, you know, setting aside the fact that, yeah, on, on, on the merits, it's not it's not hugely um, it's not an earth shaking change. It's not like it's going to change kind of the uh, or, or revolutionize the federal approach to drug policy overnight. It still is kind of this interesting on ramp to talk about, you know, how how we view uh, drug policy and and and, you know, how the what, what what the federal government's role is in trying to mitigate these harms, given the fact that at, at least at the federal level, it's it's there really has been no movement in terms of the law away from all that stuff's just illegal. And if you have it, it's a crime, you know? Yeah. I'm talking to Andrew eager from the dispatch about this crack pipe story. Let's just start with crack pipe because part of the problem here is nomenclature, because that is a very loaded term. Obviously it immediately brings up connotations in everybody's minds, but part of the problem, and you touched on this when you wrote about it, and I thought it was an excellent example is if you really dig into it, like you said, this is federal policy wading into something that's kind of been batted around for a long time. Harm reduction isn't a new concept. There's a nomenclature problem here because while drug laws are pretty black and white, when it comes to drug paraphernalia, which is what we're talking about when you get into harm reduction, what can you give them, what can't you give you? There's just some good old fashioned ambiguity in law and ambiguity in policy at work here where the government really hasn't specified what is and isn't drug paraphernalia here. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's almost, you know, the, the, the classic definition of pornography thing, you know, when you see it, I mean, that, that, that's kind of enshrined in, in federal practice, if not the law itself. I mean, there's, I, I was reading some DOJ documents in, in the course of reporting this piece um, that was basically just kind of like a, a quick crash course in, in how do you identify paraphernalia? And it's like, well, you kind of have to, you kind of have to follow, go by your gut. Like, you know, what's the uh, if, if, if you have a glass pipe that's being sold. So let's, let's talk specifically about, you know, a crack pipe. Well, there isn't, isn't any one product that, 
that is a crack pipe, right? I mean, it's people, people smoke crack with all kinds of things, improvised pipes. Usually when we talk crack pipe, we're talking a, a glass pipe of the sort that that isn't illegal to own in and of itself unless it, it's already been associated with drug use. So for instance, you could walk into a uh, smoke shops around the country and you might see, I mean, a, a lot of places won't sell them because they're, I mean, nobody smokes tobacco out of a glass pipe. Um, usually they are associated with, with illegal drug use, but you could, you could smoke tobacco out of a glass pipe. It wouldn't be a very fun experience, but, but you know, the, the, the product itself is not, is not a uh, criminal to own or sell until it's been used to smoke crack. And at that point, once it has been used to smoke crack, it is then illegal paraphernalia. Uh, and, and if you can demonstrate that, you know, if, if, if a person ha- is busted in possession of crack and with one of these pipes, they will probably also, you know, have the, have the paraphernalia, you know, tacked on because at that point, because of the context in which it's being used, uh, it's, it's known to be paraphernalia, but that's kind of the, the, the weird gray area in which, in which a lot of these things operate is that paraphernalia, the possession, uh, or actually I, I can't even say possession, the sale of, uh, or transport of, of drug paraphernalia is banned at the federal level. And, and, and the definition, the federal definition for that is extremely broad. It's basically just anything you use uh, that helps you get drugs in you is paraphernalia. But there is an exception to the federal law, which is that uh, a federal, state or local law specifically permits a person to have uh, to, you know, be in possession of these things. Then the federal doesn't apply. So that's uh, that's kind of one big carve out that would permit such a such a program as this to move forward. Then when you go down to kind of the state and the local level, it's just a it's just a huge patchwork. Almost all states or the, the majority of states do have their own prohibitions on possession of paraphernalia. They, they can prohibit uh, possession because their states. The weird thing about federal drug policy is that it is usually about uh, sale and transport because of interstate commerce uh, related reasons. But so most states prohibit uh, possession of paraphernalia. Some states carve out from their definition of paraphernalia syringes in particular, um, which again has to do with the, this harm reduction stuff that we've been talking about. A lot of states actually have these syringe services programs, they're called, where uh, you know where, where they, they permit communities to stand up these uh, these programs where users can come and turn in uh, used syringes and get clean ones in the in the hope of preventing the spread of of bloodborne diseases like HIV. And then a couple of states and a couple of localities go farther than that and have specifically ex- exempted from their definitions of paraphernalia pipes as well. So this and, and this is then the safe smoking aspect of these harm reduction policy programs is that uh, well. If we think that uh, allowing users to make sure they at least have clean syringes and aren't aren't passing them amongst each other, and we're uh, limiting uh, the spread of disease that way, maybe it also makes sense to distribute these safe smoking kits so that users are not improvising uh, pipes out of plastic bottles or, or or glass bottles or you know passing pipes around among themselves that are dirty, and you know maybe. Maybe you get a cut on your mouth from a from a aluminum can pipe, and then uh, because it's dirty, that that facilitates the transmission of Hep C or something like that. And so that's that's kind of the thought process behind a couple. Like I say, uh, I think the state of California and then a couple of localities dotted around the country have looped into these harm reduction programs, these pipes, which is where we get back to our our story because the this federal program was not going to be actually setting up any any new sorts of programs like this. It was basically just providing a grant where these programs that already exist could dip in and get some federal money for the services that they were already producing. Yeah. Sorry to sorry to talk your ear off about all that, but I think that kind of gives you the 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 some more context for what all this is about. No, and that's what we want because the detail of that, once everybody gets on their ramparts of the two sides of the media debate, you lose all that context and you forget what the actual issue at hand is. So when we come back with Andrew Eager right after this, we're going to get into that detail because the media got on their ramparts for their narratives. And the Biden administration did not handle this real well. We'll get into those details with Andrew Egger of The Dispatch right after that. Hi, welcome back to Heard Tell. We are getting deep into a story that got viral, then went viral for going viral, which is kind of the habit of our media and social media age we live in. Andrew Eager from the dispatch with us. Okay, we talked about the details of this grant, how crack pipe became a loaded term. 
Let's talk about that media reaction. You talked about how it kind of became a meta story. Uh, we know the media's favorite thing to do is cover itself. That applies to all of us, ourselves included. We're guilty too. Um, That's right. Let's do it right now. Yeah. So how did we cover <laughs> this? Because it sure seemed like uh, some of the more right-leaning social media really grabbed onto this and took off and ran with it. Uh, and then the more mainstream media almost reactionarily reacted to it. Uh, how was the media response to this thing? Right. Well, obviously, the the if you are a right wing senator, I say right wing senator, a Republican senator, uh, a, a right wing media figure, the the kind of reaction to this story writes itself. It's it's you know Biden's soft on crime, Biden's soft on drug use, Biden is an enabler uh, in terms of federal policy when it comes to uh, you know various drug drug epidemics going on around the country, um, and then there are some nastier ways to spend that, which we don't even need to really get into. Um, but for instance, you know, Tucker Carlson uh, making a big stink about uh, the Biden administration sticking up for crackheads, but ignoring the opioids epidemic, which is there are sillier and less less silly ways to, to talk about this. Let's 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 leave it there. Um, but but then after you have, you know, half a day of of kind of explosion about that with a lot of, you know, federal lawmakers weighing in, then you get uh like you say, kind of this this reaction, you get uh, a lot of places, uh, the Washington Post, the Daily Beast, getting in touch with HHS with the same people who had been corresponding with the Free Beacon and doing really damage control. And uh, and the first wave of that was basically, I mean, it was honestly really just a, just a sloppy uh, set of pieces that came out that were all predicated on the notion that the Free Beacon had been basically lying, or at least had had mistaken its own story. And they were, you know, they, that 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 this whole thing was much ado about nothing. That there was no, you know, uh, there never were going to be any pipes distributed in these in these safe smoking kits, and the safe smoking kits themselves were only, you know, a small part of this grant. And and basically, you know, just just pieces saying, well, what's the big deal? What are you getting all worked up about? It later and and uh, uh, part of that was HHS itself trying to kind of walk back uh, its own you know, its own comments to the Free Beacon, where they basically said, well, we never confirmed there would be pipes in, in any of these kits. We just said that there would be, you know, funding for these safe smoking kits. And in fact, uh, it would have been impossible for us to have funded pipes in these uh, kits because these kits we we made plain in the grant have to be compliant with all relevant federal, local and state laws. Well, that was kind of a weird thing for HHS to say for the reasons we've already talked about, which is that it would be perfectly possible for programs in, in these places that have already kind of got these programs going to apply for such grants because they exist in, in places where there's already been kind of a legal movement over the last few years uh, to to facilitate this sort of thing. I mean, California, it was 2018 when they uh, when they explicitly passed a law that, uh, that, that, that broadened the exclusion of their paraphernalia laws to include smoking supplies. So, uh, so California is kind of a, a perfect example of a place where, you know, their own department of, of, of health uh, in California endorses the use of these kits, uh, thinks that, you know, it's, it's to the, it's to the public health, it's to the benefit of, of public health in the state uh, that, that if you're using drugs, at least, uh, at least you're not additionally damaging your health, via the paraphernalia that you're using. Um, and, and these are exactly the kind of programs that the grant was plainly in its own language intended to, to facilitate. So that round was really sloppy and, uh, and, 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 and quite bad. Um, they did nail the Free Beacon on one small technical point, which is that the Free Beacon reported in its original piece that uh, an HHS spokesman had confirmed that pipes would be in, in the kits. Um, it was so, it was sort of immaterial to the story because HHS was not distributing any kits. You know, the the, the assembly of the kits was was happening at, at all of these, you know, these places that already had these programs, and HHS was just funding them. They did, you know, have and, and it was basically through that through that crack uh, in in the Free Beacons reporting that HHS tried to run and that all these these places kind of tried to tried to cover. Um, and then then there was another round of, of media reporting the following day. There was another piece in the Washington Post uh, that, that did a much better job of kind of getting at the, the actual complexities here. The New York Times had a good piece on the same thing. I had a piece. Uh, it was pretty good, in my opinion. <laughs> but I, I, what's what's really interesting to me about this whole kind of media media furor that that took place is that you know it, it very quickly becomes a conversation about you know was the free beacon out over its skis 
did this program ever actually exist? Was the Daily Beast, you know, the the media transgressor for for unfairly knocking the free beacon? Um, and, and everybody starts arguing about these things. Uh, meanwhile, the Biden administration, which I guess never really maybe never really expected there to be much of a controversy about this at all. And this is not an uncommon thing either, right? That, that, that you would just have a program that's taking place. Uh, you know, nobody in the white house has necessarily seen it or okayed it. It's just like, whoever's putting these, these grant packages together, who are the policy experts at the, at the, at the relevant department. And then it suddenly becomes controversial and, and the, you know, the political administration, the white house runs away from it because, you know, they, maybe in a vacuum, they it would they, they would support it as good policy, but they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna spend political capital defending this tiny program. So they're gonna they're gonna try to defuse the situation, right? Um but uh the the fact that it that that it becomes that conversation, the fact that the White House immediately runs away and says, well there's not we're gonna exclude pipes from these kits now because of this controversy and kind of tries to pretend that they were all, they were always excluded even though they were not, that kind of obscures the actual conversation, which is that, you know, we, we, we haven't really had a, a, a national fight about harm reduction in in public health. Uh, I mean, wonks care about these things. There are organizations. Harm Reduction International is one uh, that do a lot of research and and do a lot of advocacy, suggesting that it, it actually is to the to the public good that that these these services exist, um, that it actually helps pull people out of addiction. It doesn't uh, con- confirm them in their addictions, at least again, again, according to these advocates, and they've they've had a certain amount of success, as as we've talked about. I mean, there there have been some states and some cities that have taken their advocacy to heart and have have moved forward with these sorts of programs. And this was kind of the first, uh, at least in my in my knowledge, the first big uh, national fight over, or I don't know, I don't know about fight, but first, first time this, this sort of thing, at least as, as far as pipes are concerned, really entered the national conversation. Uh, but we just, we just all spent the whole week kind of just fighting about, at least in the media space, uh, who, who had done the good reporting and who had done the bad reporting. Um, and it was just sort of, and, and, and now it's sort of receding into the rearview mirror with, uh, without anybody really having talked about the actual issue much, which is, you know, should it be the, the case that the federal government, um, you know, is is throwing its weight behind uh, behind some of these harm reduction programs in in its in its federal health policy spending. I mean, that's that that's the point of that money, right? Is to is is to go to programs around the country that are that are reducing, pushing for these these better public health outcomes, but is helping users use more safely. Is that a third rail that the federal government shouldn't get involved with because it's illegal and because it's you know controversial uh, because it's an illegal uh, you know it's illicit substances and things. But I think the Biden administration it it, it didn't want to <laughs> to uh, like I said spend political capital on that particular fight over such a small amount of money to begin with. So I think uh, instead it just it just became this media story. Yeah, talking to Andrew Eager from uh, The Dispatch, uh, our friend Dr. Keith Humphreys, who is an expert on addiction, testifies before the Senate, things like this. He actually made the point that with the government spending $7 million a minute, by the time you read all the tweets about this, the expenditures already passed. My criticism of the Biden administration this year beyond just politics and ideology stuff is consistently on big issues, they are absolutely optic obsessed with anything that gets into the news cycle that is negative to them, especially if it's a sensitive cultural type issue like this. I think some blame goes on them here because the media is going to be the media. Social media is what social media is. This is a leadership thing of like, well, what if the, even if you're not fully for harm reduction, if they would have just stuck to their guns here, then you would have gotten that conversation about harm reduction, but they did a reaction to the optics again and ended up kind of looking silly. And you probably, if you're an advocate for harm reduction, you probably just set that back and talk about, because now everybody's going to reference this. And when they Google search it, this is going to pop up instead of some actual programs that might actually help people. Right, right, and and some of these groups, um, the uh, the Drug Policy Alliance, I, I believe, for one, did kind of uh, ding the Biden administration for for the walk back, and they said, well, we had been under the impression that the that this was a grant that was intended to fund these these safe smoking kits that included pipes, um, you know, and 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 we think that's a good thing, you know, we were we were you know. Uh, the, the there were various groups lining up to apply for these apply for these grants. You know, this was not like some, uh, you know, theoretical program that was going to be funded. You know, months down the line, the the deadline had come to to apply for these things, and and there were groups that were already that had already sent in applications that were that were you know intending on distributing these kits. 
Uh, and, and, and exactly what you say is their argument. And it is a strange thing. I mean, it, it, you, you do see this tension in the Biden administration a lot where uh, on some things it's very plain that they are it's a progressive White House. I mean, uh, the, the, the bills that they the bills that they put out um, on on issue after issue after issue, uh, I mean, particularly economic stuff. There is there is a certain amount of, you, you know, you look at you look at the, the human infrastructure bill and you're like, well, come on. I mean, like you're you're. You're a you're a progressive Democrat running a progressive Democrat's White House and, and you know, you know, own that. But it, it does seem as though there's there are like certain issues where where Biden still I don't know if it's him or if it's just people in his shop or, or, or who, but uh, still wants to distance himself from from these sort of right wing furors in a way that you would, you know, you might expect uh, a, a very progressive president presidency to just kind of go tell those critics to sit on attack or something, you know, um, we've, we've seen this. I, I mentioned in the piece one one issue where we saw this was refugee resettlement last year where where Biden kind of ran on uh, re-expanding the, the refugee caps that President Trump had, had slashed dramatically during his time in office. And and Biden had had campaigned against that and said that, you know, that's not who we are. But then when he gets back into office, he he drags his feet for months and months um, on that issue, even as, you know, all the, the, there's a lot of conflict uh, melting down around the world. Uh, and and there's a lot of reporting that said that that was that was primarily optics driven, that, you know, he didn't want to get stuck with, uh, you know, right wing critiques of Biden as throwing open the, you know, throwing open the borders uh, since since immigration is a, a significantly motivating uh, right wing issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a policy expert in this in this area. I, I, I was getting up to speed with harm reduction, uh, same as everybody else was uh, last week. But but I mean, you know, it makes sense to me. I mean, it's I I I read a harm a harm reduction international uh, policy paper and I'm like, yeah, actually, that does seem like, you know, a, a worthwhile public health end. And and it does seem like the Biden administration could have could have done the same. I mean, could have just been like, no, 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 you're 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 overreacting to this 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 minor thing. But let us you know sit you down and explain why these programs are important. And I think probably if it had been a bigger a bigger kind of administration push from the beginning. That's probably what you would have seen, but but it was it was just sort of the the, the nature of the way the the story came out. Where the, I, I'm I'm sure the first that Jen Psaki heard about this program was when it was when it had already been become controversial, and it was like, well, surely we're not doing that, and then like, oh, we are doing that. Well, now we kind of need to back away from that, and it becomes adversarial, and um and 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 unfolds the way that we saw it unfold. Yeah, it's a hot mess. Andrew Egger from the Dispatch. Uh, great information on this. You, this is what you do at the Dispatch. You go deeper into the stories. You get good information. That's what we try to do on our program. Let folks know about the Dispatch and what you got going on and where they can follow you on your social media going forward, my friend. Oh yeah, well thanks. Well, it's uh, it's just the Dispatch dot com. We're uh, we're a center right outlet launched in twenty nineteen. Gosh, twenty nineteen. It was. That feels more recently than it was. The, we, we've basically been in business for the entire pandemic, is it plus plus change. Um, but yeah, we're based in D.C. Uh, Jonah Goldberg and Steve Hayes are fearless leaders. Um, follow me on Twitter at Egger DC if you feel like it. Thanks for having me on. Had a good time. Yeah, come for the uh, in-depth analysis. Stay for the baby pictures, which he is putting out at great regularity in a good clip, <laughs> which he should because it's a beautiful baby. Congratulations, my friend. And we'll have you back on next time you write something up. We appreciate having you. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.